We're Dave and Carol Sharp of Idlewild. Uh, we're going to tell you some Celtic stories today. Most of them are from the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man is a little jewel of an island that sits right in the heart of the Irish Sea. For if you were on the west coast there on Dalby Point, you could see Ireland in the distance on the horizon. And if you were on the other side of the island, you could see Scotland and Wales. And the people there speak a form of Gaelic mixed with Old Norse for the Vikings, made their raids from the island for many centuries and mixed with the people that were there, the Gaelic people. And the people there have learned their tales and songs and music from the other world or the fairy world. Uh, but the cats there have no tails. If you've ever seen a Manx cat, it has no tail. And the island is named for the great and famous Celtic sea god, Manannan MacLear. And it's there that tinkers uh, ply their trade about the island. For tinkers were itinerant homeless tinsmiths and repairmen. And, uh, but they were, although their services were greatly needed, they were often suspected of uh, stealing vegetables from your garden or a pie cooling in the window or, or snatching a child and making it work for the tinkers. Uh, but Donald and most tinkers were like most people. They were good people, actually. And Donald was a good tinker. And he was camped outside the little town of Lamfell Moor on an evening, uh, not far from Dalby Point, where you could see Ireland in the distance. And that night he ate his supper, and the moon rose over the peaks in the east. And when it did so, Donald could hear a mysterious flute playing out in the wilderness, a tune that he knew from his childhood called Mina Corain, the Old Miser. Well, Donald could stand it no more, so he made his way down the path in the dark in the forest until at some point he could see firelight twinkling between the trunks of the trees up ahead, and there in a little clearing danced wee glashen, or goblins, as they were known in the Manx tongue. And one played a harp, and one played a flute, and all the rest danced around the bonfire to an ancient melody uh, that the peasants used to dance to many centuries ago in celebration when they would harvest limpets and seaweed uh, from the seashore. Uh, And he said, Here's with the wizard's hand that moved at midnight's witching hour and gathered the sheep from the coming storm. Ere the shepherds saw it lower, yet asked no, no fee save a scattered sheaf from the peasant's garnered hoard or a cream bowl kissed by a virgin lip set out on the household board. And from out in the little forest where Donald was listening to the music of the goblins, he muttered to himself, Ah, whatever that means, for he didn't understand a word of poetry. And then the wee goblins played another tune and danced another dance. This time, it was to an ancient melody that milkmaids on the island would sing when they would milk the cows in order to charm the milk so that it would be healthy for you. It was, of course, called the milking song. One played a harp, one played a flute, and all the rest danced around the bonfire. <laughs> disappeared into the dark of the forest, 
just as the campfire winked out, poof, as if by magic. Well, Donald went back to his own campsite. And there he vowed to himself that he would wait all through the next day in order to hear the music of the goblins again. So all through that next day, and as it got dark and as it got late, he began to hear the mysterious flute playing out in the wilderness once again. And once again, he made his way down the path through the forest in the dark until he could see firelight twinkling between the trunks of the trees up ahead. And once again, in the little clearing, danced the wee goblins. And as the music would lilt slowly, they would dance slowly. And as it picked up tempo, they would dance more lively. And the wind seemed to rise and fall with the enchantment of the melody as if the very tempo of the tune governed how the wind would blow. One played a harp, one played a flute to an ancient melody called Ilium a Hollier, or William the Tailor, and all the rest danced around the bonfire. goblin who had played the flute held it up to the moonlight as he had on the previous night and he said then let them circle him about and very like to pinch the unclean knight and ask him why and there so sacred paths he dares to tread in shape profane and from out in the little forest where donald was hiding and listening to the music of the goblins he muttered to himself yet again whatever that means, for he still didn't understand a word of poetry. And then the wee goblins were about to dance another dance and to play another tune, but the wind that night blew in chill off the Irish Sea, and Donald had neither a coat nor a jacket. And as he lay in his hiding place, oh, shivering from the cold, and his nose dripping suddenly, ah <laughs> And all the goblins looked in the direction of the sound, and they said, Who's there? Who's there? So Donald stood up and he said, It's only I, a lonely tinker, and I was just listening to the lovely music you're playing there. And the goblin said, You have not. You were spying. I wasn't just listening, said Donald. And then the wee goblin who had played the flute pointed at it, Donald, and he said, Not everyone could hear the songs of birds, nor everyone to all their words. And Donald called back, well, who knows what all that means, all that poetry you're spouting there. I haven't got a clue. And then the wee goblins disappeared into the dark of the forest as they had on the previous night. Only this time their laughter echoed through the wooded hillside. <laughs> you'll see. Oh, you'll see. All right. So Donald walked over to where the campfire blazed merrily. And uh, the very second, though, that he put his foot over the threshold of the little clearing, the campfire winked out, poof, as if by magic, and Donald fell down unconscious and remembered nothing more until morning. Well, when Donald next woke up, he was laying on his back in the little clearing. The morning light was streaming golden green through the leaves. And the birds were singing, oh, and their song was so beautiful. And so he, until he sat up. But there, uh, next to the campfire, the burnt out campfire, lay that mysterious goblin's flute. And he said, oh, would you look at that? For it had little silver hasps around each of the sections. And a triskelion of three legs carved in the end cap, the very symbol of the Isle of Man to this day. It's on the flag. Look it up. <laughs> and it was made of black wood, both rare and precious on the island. And Donald said, oh, I'm going to keep you. And so he ran back to his own campsite. And there he put the flute into a pack on his handcart to keep it safe. And that day he figured he'd better go into the little town of Lamfell Moor and sell his tinware, for that is how tinkers make their sustenance, uh, by selling their work. He took up the handles of the cart and he trudged into the little town of Lamfell Moor. And there at the very edge of the village green, he set up his cart to sell his wares. 
Well, something happened to Donald that day that had never happened to him before. Why, all the men and women of, of Lamfell Moor surrounded Donald's cart, and they bought everything that Donald had made. Ten pots, ten pans, ten spoons, ten cups, ten ladles. If Donald made it out of ten, he sold it, until at the end of the day he had sixteen silver pennies tied up in a sock on his belt. New food to feast for weeks, and new tin sheets to make new things out of. Well, he packed up his cart and pulled by the handles out to his campsite from the night before. And when he got there, he set up his camp and lit his supper fire. And he had a sumptuous dinner of turnips and apples and a little sausage. And when he had finished, when the moon rose over the peaks in the east, he remembered the lovely flute that he'd found that morning. And he ran over to the pack and he pulled out the flute and he looked up at the moonlight and he said to no one there, oh, if only I could play the goblin's flute. And without really knowing how or why, he played one of the many tunes he'd heard the goblins play from his hiding place in the woods. This one was called My Little Brown Girl. <laughs> Wonders of wonders, said Donald. But you might have guessed yourself that the flute was enchanted and held a great and mysterious power in some way. Well, Donald found that he was no longer shunned by the villagers of the Isle of Man, in fact, quite the opposite, for they loved to see him come and hear him play his flute. They loved to buy his tinware and everything he would make, and he made little tin whistles out of tin and would sell them to the villagers for just a penny, a penny whistle, thus, or a tin whistle, as it were, and teach them to play tunes like the peat fire flame. <laughs> As I said, Donald was no longer shunned for being a tinker on the Isle of Man. And on a particular night, when he was camped in the very south of the island, outside of St. Johnstown, he camped near the crossroads, and there he played his flute after dinner, as was his wont. And many of the people from St. Johnstown came to sit under the trees and listen, or to dance in the crossroads, as they did in those days, or to play along. Uh, if they had an instrument with them, and Donald played one that everyone from the village knew it was called the Fahabi Jig. And many of the people from St. Johnstown danced beneath the starlight. <laughs> And then Donald held the flute up to the moonlight, and he said, such a soft, floating witchery of sound as twilight elfins make, as they any voyage on gentle gales from fairyland. <laughs> and all the villagers laughed with Donald, for they didn't understand a word of poetry either. The end. And if you did understand that poetry, Make sure you thank your English teachers. Good job, English teachers. This next story we're going to tell you is called, uh, 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 is how Donald met his wife, the Magic Spectacles. And so Donald, as I said, was successful as a tinker. And he was camped in the very center of the Isle of Man in a little forest. And there, uh, after his supper fire, uh, here again, the moon rose over in the east. And uh, he got his flute out to play at the flute as was his wont uh, in those days, for he, he dearly loved music. And uh, uh, he, he was no sooner into the tune, but just a bar or two of music. 
when into the clearing ran two angry goblins, and between them they were tugging on a pair of golden spectacles. They're mine, they're mine, oh no, they're mine. Father left them to me, no, give them to me. No, they're my magic spectacles. And soon they were rolling around on the ground, kicking each other and gouging each other's eyes out, biting each other's ears, and all the while tugging on the golden spectacles between them. Donald ran over and he said, get up, get up. What is wrong with you two? And when they stood up, Donald said, what are your names anyway? I'm Scoggins and he's Boggins. No, I'm, Sc- I'm Boggins and he's Scoggins. And Donald said, well, I guess that's right. He says, what are you doing? And the two of them tugging on the golden spectacles said, you decide, you decide who should get our father's magic spectacles. And Donald said, oh, magic spectacles, is it? Well, give them to me, lads. So they gave Donald the magic spectacles, and he quickly broke them in half. And he said, there, each of you get a half a spectacle with a lens each in it. And so Donald said, that's what you get for interrupting my after supper tune. And as I said, they were magic spectacles. And they see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see, of course. And so uh, Scoggins put his lens to his eye, and he looked at Donald's flute and realized what it was. He said, is that a magic flute you have there? And Donald said, why, it sure is, and it plays a lovely tune or two, I'll tell you. And so Scoggins said, then play us a tune. And Boggins said, yes, a tune. And Donald said, I'll play you a tune. The tune you so rudely interrupted when I was having my after supper tune. And so Donald played a tune called the Fairy Reel, and the goblins stood out by the campfire, ready to dance, and from behind their backs they pulled out tambourines. For as everyone knows, goblins dearly love to dance. <laughs> Faster and faster the goblins danced. They spun around like tops. They leaped high into the air like deer. They began to somersault and cartwheel and backflips. And soon they began to sweat profusely from the exertion of their their, their dancing. Great gouts of sweat. And, and suddenly they began to complain. Oh, suddenly it's really hot, suddenly. And Donald began to hear the sound of bacon sizzling in the pan. <laughs> Smoke rose into the air from the goblins. And they threw up their hands together and screamed, We're burning! And up they went in two columns of flame. Foot, foot, and down into two piles of ash. Plof, plof, with a half a gold spectacle on top of each pile. And a little bit of tambourines here and there. And Donald said, at his flute, he said, Well, it's never done that before. And so Donald went over and he picked up the two halves of the spectacles and he welded them back together for he was a tinker after all and he looked at him magic spectacles or not it would be a shame to waste them and so he put them in his pocket and he packed up his hand cart and figured that day he'd better go into the little town of Lamb Felmore and sell his tinware for that of course is how tinkers make their sustenance picking up the cart handles he trudged in along north to the road to the little village. And there there was a great town hall in the very center of the village. And the town criers were out. Today, the Lord Toboggan will be married to the Lady Priscilla. So Donald pulled his cart to the back door of the great town hall, and an angry servant came out. And he said, bring your pots and pans inside, and I'll pay you and feed you when you're done. And so Donald had done that, and when he was finished and had been paid, he sat in the corner at a table in the great hall uh, to uh, order his food from the menu, and he picked up the menu, and he was looking at it. He thought he better use some glasses to see what he was reading. And so when he put the glasses on but looked up from the menu, he realized that all the angry servants were, in fact, hideous, smirking goblins, and they were busy pulling pranks on the incoming guests and family, for when they would come in, they would trip them as they would come through the door. <laughs> Boop! Or they'd pinch them when they came by. Ow! And, and soon they were spitting in their food. Patooey! And Donald took the glasses off, And all is as it was before. There were no angry goblins. There were just busy servants. And when he put them back on, he realized that the groom himself, the Lord Toboggan, was in fact a hideous, giant, slobbering goblin king with a great gold crown. 
and all of his groomsmen were in fact hideous and dangerous goblin warriors. And Donald took the glasses off and he said, what deviltry is this? For he didn't know what to do. That was when the great goblin king, who appeared to be a handsome gentleman to all the arriving guests, raised his goblet and said to the audience, he said, And now, my lady Priscilla will play us a tune on her harp and entertain us before the wedding. And so lady Priscilla came to the head of the hall, and she sat down and she said, And now, I will play a tune called, um, Our Ship Did Sail, just as Donald came over and stood beside her to play along with her, for he dearly loved music. Well, the audience applauded thunderously, and Lady Priscilla said to Donald, well, that was very lovely what you played. I enjoyed it. And Donald said, I enjoyed it myself immensely. But Lady Priscilla, said Donald, I think that you should look through these glasses and see what is going on around the hall uh, unbeknownst to you. And so she put the glasses on and she said, oh, my goodness, there's goblins everywhere. And she took the glasses off and all is as it was before. And she put the glasses back on and she realized her her betrothed was a hideous, smirking goblin king. She said, whatever on earth are we going to do? Giving the glasses back to Donald. And uh, Donald said, well, I don't know right yet, but when I think of something, I'll let you know and get rid of this hideous infestation of goblins for you. Well, that was when the great goblin king, who appeared to be a handsome gentleman, spotted the tinker up there with his flute next to his bride-to-be, and he stood up with his goblet, and he said, I say, tinker, play us a lively tune for my men and I to dance to, and we'll get this party started off right, won't we, boys? And all of his men said, <laughs> oh, Yes, yes, we will, boss, we surely, surely will. And so the great goblin king stood out on the dance floor, and all of his groomsmen stood around him, who were in fact hideous goblin warriors, and all of their uh, goblin minions, who appeared to be uh, her, her angry servants. Donald looked at him and said, Well, I have a tune for you, your worship. Uh, how about the fairy reel? And he leaned over to Lady Priscilla and he said, in a whispering voice, he said, This may be the very opportunity we're looking for. And so the great goblin king uh, uh, and all his men pulled out from behind their backs tambourines. For as everyone should have remembered in myth and legend and fact that goblins dearly loved to dance. And so Donald played a tune for them all to dance to called the fairy reel. <laughs> Faster and faster the goblins danced until they spun around like tops. They leaped high into the air like deer. They began to cartwheel and backflip and somersault. And soon they began to sweat from the exertions that they were doing and capering about. Oh, suddenly it's really hot in here, said all the goblins. And soon uh, they began to smoke. And the smoke rose up off the goblins until it filled the ceiling above. And they began to complain because everyone began to hear the sound of bacon sizzling in the pan. <laughs> And all the goblins began to complain. Oh, <laughs> hot foot! Oh, <laughs> hot foot! Hot foot! And suddenly, all twenty goblins went up in great columns of flame. Foot, 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 foot. And last of all, the great goblin king himself raised his great hairy arms to the ceiling and he said, Oh, ho, 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 worst of all, I'm burning. And up he went in a great column of flame. <laughs> Into a great pile of ash with a gold crown right on top. Well, now there were 20 piles of ash and one great big one in the center with a gold crown. There were bits and pieces of tambourine everywhere. And Donald went out and he picked up the gold crown and put it into a satchel that he carried. For it would have been a shame to waste it. And Lady Priscilla said... 
you've saved me from having to marry that big slobbery, blubbery, rude, crude, oh, lecher, did I say slobbery? A lecherous, treacherous Lord Toboggan. Oh, and he was, he was so full of himself, too. And Donald said, well, think nothing of it. I was proud to do it. And Donald looked around, and a great wedding feast was all set, ready to go. For there were plates piled with roast turkey and pot roast, and, and there was chickens and all kinds of manners of things. There was potatoes, and there was uh, candied yams, and there was dessert, and there was everything ready to go. The priest was here and everything, and Donald looked and said, You don't suppose that you could marry a humble tinker like myself? And Lady Priscilla said, Well, uh... We do play beautiful music together, and uh, uh, suddenly I'm available, and uh, my dance card is free, if you know what I mean. And Donald said, I think I do. And she said, I do. And so the guests swept out all of the ashes of the goblins, and the priest came forward and married the two couple, the, the couple, and uh, they had a splendid feast together, one that they remembered for generations, a great and wonderful wedding feast. For the town criers went about saying, Today, the, Lord, the Lady Priscilla is married to Donald the Tinker. And, and so the two of them, Donald and Lady, Lady Priscilla, played music happily together forever after. said on the Isle of Man that it was free from the infestation of goblins for many centuries after to this present day. But you wouldn't be able to tell now unless you had a magic pair of spectacles. Now would you? The end. <laughs> this next tune, this next story I should say, that we're going to tell you is uh, uh, Donald of course was married to Lady Priscilla to his great joy. He had enough silver coin or wherewithal to build a little cottage right out on Dalby Point uh, uh, where he could see Ireland on the horizon out there. And to their great joy, they had a child. But to their great disappointment, the young man, after 20 years, could neither walk nor talk and had to sit in a chair by the fire, a great big baby that had to be fed by his mother. Well, what the young couple didn't know was that when the child was first born, the fairies had come and taken the real child away and raised it as their own, and in its place, they left one of their own, a changeling from the other world. And so it was that the young couple didn't realize this wasn't their son after all, but a changeling from the other world. And as Lady Priscilla one day was out working in the fields, uh, 20 years from the birth of the lad, his birthday as a matter of fact, uh, Donald was hard at work making the little tin whistles that he sold about the island when the young man spoke from his chair by the fire for the first time in 20 years. And he said, uh, if you don't tell anybody, I'll dance and play the tambourine. And Donald said, well, this is amazing, lad. Uh, why have you never spoken in all these 20 years? Uh, uh, in either case, here, I'll, uh, I'll play a tune for you. How about the echoes of Killarney? And the young man swept up the tambourine and danced about the room like a madman. And sure enough, he could dance and step it out lively with the tambourine when he spoke to the tinker for the second time in 20 years. And he said, uh, if you don't tell anybody, I'll play one of those tin whistles you just finished working on on the bench there. And so Donald said, here, lad, play that one. Uh, let's play on our tin whistles together. Uh, how about uh, Jack's Alive? So together they played a tune called Jack's Alive. And 
But sure enough, he could play the tin whistle as well. When he said to the tinker for the third time in 20 years, he said, uh, if you don't tell anybody, I'll play mom's harp that's been sitting here next to the fireplace. And Donald said, well, she's, she's out working in the fields, lad. I don't think she'll mind. How about if we play together um, Kemp's jig? And if you've, any of you have ever been to a Renaissance fair before, you would know that William Kemp was Shakespeare's own clown and actor. And this was said to have been the very tune he danced to all of his life when he worked for Mr. Shakespeare. It was called Kemp's jig, of course, like this. He could play the harp as well. Well, they had a splendid afternoon together, laughing, dancing, singing, talking. And yet, when the wife finally came home from working in the fields, there was Donald once again, sitting in his bench, making the tin whistles he sold about the island. And once again, there was their son sitting in his chair by the fire, a great big baby that could neither walk nor talk and, and had to be fed by his mother. Uh, and so... She would look at her son, and she would look at her husband, and she was greatly disappointed. She'd look at her son, look at her husband, and she'd say, Oh, we've got a fine young man there to carry on your trade for you. What are we going to do, and who's going to take care of us in our old age? And Donald said, Well, actually, we've had a splendid afternoon together, but I think we should build a fire and put him on it. And his wife said, oh, and the poor little thing can neither walk nor talk. And Donald said, well, he can play the tin whistle. He can play your harp and he can run, dance, jump and sing with the tambourine. I tell you, he must be a changeling from the other world. So it was the young couple began to build a fire. For in those days, that was how you would tell if your child was a changeling or not, is you would build a fire and you'd pass the child over the fire, once, twice, maybe three times, and it would turn back into what it once was and go back to fairyland, and in turn, the fairies would leave your own child in its place. At least that's how it works in theory. So I don't want any of you children trying this at home on your little brothers or sisters, okay? All right, promise me. So the young couple began to build a fire, and the young man began to realize they would put him to the test. He'd be found out as a changeling. And so, reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a golden ball that shone like the sun. And throwing it out the door, he went after it, and in a flash of light, he was never heard of or seen in this mortal world again, I swear, the end. Now you might wonder, I've had people ask me, was their child returned? When we read the story, that's where it ended. I would like to think he was. My brother was a changeling, and we never did that to him. So this next story uh, is, co is called The Fairy Cup of Kirk Malu. It's also from the Isle of Man. And uh, I have heard many a Manxman complain incessantly about being carried through the night sky half conscious and deposited on top of some lonesome mountain peak. Why, an old fellow I knew by the name of Old Donald uh, was led by invisible musicians for many miles from home. Rum tum tuddle dee dum tum toddy, rum tum tuddle dee dum tum to, rum tum toddy, rum tum toddy, rum tum tuddle dee dum tum to, until he came out on a deserted meadow many, many miles from home that he'd never seen before. There, beneath the great harvest moon, sat a huge oaken feasting table. And all the little people were about it. And they had piles of food. And they were laughing and stuffing their little faces. And having a great time. Singing songs and having a merry time of it. Some played lively music. <laughs> Whoopee! Right elbow swing! Hee hee hee! Whoop! 
came and he took a seat at the great feasting table. And soon the little people had passed out plates in front of everyone. And on each plate, including Donald, and on each plate they put a slice of pie. And all the little people would grab their plate by the, by the edges like this. And they would open their mouths up as wide as their whole bodies. And they'd tilt the plate up like this and the piece of pie would slide down into their gullets with a And then they would burp. And then they'd wipe their mouths with their little sleeves. Mm. Oh, that was good. And then they all looked at Donald together and they said, Aren't you going to eat your pie? And Donald said, Well, no, I've just come from home. I've had me supper. I'm full up to here. I couldn't eat another bite. Trust me. And so the little people began to pass out more food. There were turkey legs. There were chicken. There was uh, roast pheasant. There was roast beef. There was potato soup. There was turnips. There was every kind of thing. Donald turned everything down. And then after some while, Donald realized that many of the little people looked very familiar to him like neighbors he had known from decades and decades ago. He couldn't remember if they'd moved away or drowned at sea or what it was, but he, they were smaller than he remembered, you know, about yay tall. And uh, the little people also said, you look very familiar to us too, they said, and uh, couldn't quite place where. And uh, that was when libations were being poured out all around the table, and the little people filled a great and giant gold cup crusted over with jewels and other things, and four of the little fellows handed the cup up to Donald and gave it to him. Donald took the great golden fairy cup, and he put it to his lips, and inside it had a dark and mysterious liquor. And when he put it to his lips, one of the little people that looked like a neighbor he had known from decades ago said, If you do, you'll be as I am, and you'll go home no more to your family. Well, Donald was much affrighted, and he set the cup on the table and vowed silently to himself that he would not touch a single bite of food or drop of drink, for as he remembered, truthfully, that if you did, if you had a drop to drink or a bit to eat, you would stay in the fairy world for an eternity. And so the partying and merrymaking went on and on and on. Some of the little fellows were juggling turnips. <laughs> Some would spin plates in the air. They were having a grand time when at the very head of the table, the fairy queen herself rose up and stood on the chair, for she was little to be seen, right? And she said, we shall bring forth the musicians. We shall have a fairy dance in the meadow. And so all the musicians came forth out onto the meadow with their drums and, and their instruments and their tambourines and other things. And all the little people followed out there and lined up for a great dance. And the, and the dance went something like this. <laughs> Well, right during the height of all the merrymaking and all the dancing, Donald took the cup that was sitting in front of him, in front of him with a dark and mysterious liquor in it, and when he thought no one was looking, he poured it out under the table, sploosh. But when he did so, all the music stopped, and all the little people and all the lights disappeared in the blink of an eye, including the table and all the wonderful food that was laid out. And there was Donald, standing in a place alone in the moonlight, with a great golden fairy cup, many, many miles from home. Well, it took him all the rest of that night to hike his way home, and he went to bed. And he got up past noon, and he went to see uh, the parson at the, at the Kirk Malu parish. And he said, Father, what should I do with this great golden fairy cup? You know, if anyone were to find that I had this, a rumor got around that I had this, this great treasure in my house, heavy gold with all of these jewels in it, they'd come from clear from Ireland and Scotland just to murder me for it. And the priest thought for a second, and he said, well, you know, Jimmy, I think you should take this golden fairy cup uh, and leave it in the service of the church. But I think I'd have to bless it first in order to remove the fairy twang from it. And so when he had done that, the priest set it up on a, on a shelf 
high above the altar where it's used for the consecrated wine to this day and the services at the church at Kirk Malu. And a truer story, I have never told you. <laughs> and now, uh, before we... Uh, we're going to play a song for you, and then we'll answer some questions for you. This song is, is, is a Welsh piece, unlike the Manx pieces we've heard. Uh, the Welsh are a separate uh, Celtic people. Uh, they speak Kimrig, and uh, we're going to do this uh, part, uh, two verses in Welsh and one verse in uh, English. And I, I should say that we also studied the language at the National School at Nant Gutheren, and uh, I learned to speak a little bit of some phrases and sing some songs. And uh, I learned to ask for coffee in the morning from the B&B hosts, uh, where I'd say, Gai gafi da, which means, may I have a cup of coffee, please? And the hostess in these places would say, oh, you little darling, you speak Welsh. And they'd soon jabber off on a conversation I got nothing from, because I'd have to confess that I did not speak Welsh in conversational uh, level. Uh, but I could ask for cream with that. I could say a cleith. And so this wonderful tune is called Arhida Nos. You may recognize it as a Christmas tune all through the night, but it was first a lullaby. And uh, nos meaning night. So if you want to say good night to someone, you say nos da. So Arhida Nos. <laughs> Our share, the way don't our heed a nose. Dim a fourth evro, go ganyant, our heed a nose. Go la ra ra ho teal slack, ye are tango squir, bread va thock, tell a nevoth, moon tavaloch, our heed a nose. O my shirial, when a sharon. Where he the knows, e o loi, where the heaven are he the knows. No su henight, come the custic, on the hardeth, dim I hoteth, from in golau, one in killeth, are he the knows. Sleep a while and peace attend thee all through the night. Guardian angels, God will lend thee all through the night. Soft the dreaming hours are creeping, hill and vale in slumber sleeping. God alone his watch is keeping all through the night. <laughs> okay, so we have a question. It says, where do you get your music from to go with the stories you tell? So my wife, for the last 30 years, have played Celtic and uh, Pioneer and Appalachian together, folk music like together, and happily ever after, for 30 years. I just have to throw <laughs> in, some of our stories are a little bit autobiographical, because we did get together by pairing up to try a few tunes, and it were, and that was history. <laughs> and so we've played that music now for 30 years and we research it and, and we come from that heritage in our family but like most Americans we've been become part of the great melting pot and but we had to rediscover a lot of our own heritage uh, when we did this we have another question what uh what what is what is that what led you to tell stories oh yeah oh can I tell that one yeah go ahead I, I like to show to people that I can talk to. Now, in some of our newer <laughs> stories, I've gotten brave and done more talking. How we got into it is my husband and I uh, got married and formed a band at the same time about 29 years ago, playing Celtic music and different kinds of music and really loved it. And at some point in time later on, a really good friend of ours who's a wonderful storyteller, Mark Gallagher, who some of the people around the area have run into, that was an old friend of Dave's, said, I'm going to tell some Celtic stories and your music would be a really great addition to it. So we got together and we worked up the set and it was great. And then Dave said, I want to tell the stories 
too and do the music. So we were off and running. Yes, and my father was also a great storyteller that told stories of landing a glider on D-Day or, or uh, stories about our family and all of their accomplishments. And I listened attentively to all of that. Um, uh, Celtic, uh, let's see, what... what uh, Oh, uh, how about uh, one we've had quite a bit of is where did you, uh, what about your instruments that you play? And I'll let Carol talk to you about her harp here. Yes, um, I am going to get a little bit closer to the microphone so you can hear me better. Uh, I'm going to hold this harp up a little bit so that you can see it. Um, my first wedding, well, my first harp was a wedding present from my husband, uh, but this one uh, we commissioned to have made for us later on, and Dave is a wood carver. He did the carving on this harp, and a friend of ours in town constructed it. I've got Celtic knotwork on it. I was able to put anything what I, I wanted, which is great. I've put a raven's head on it. I've got some Norse runes on the side. And uh, it was just really fun to, to make this uh, and design it. And this is the size of harp that would have been played around Scotland and Ireland. Uh, you couldn't really put one of the big classical harps on a horse and take it with you. So this one you can carry around and take with you. And uh, in Ireland and Scotland, uh, musicians would travel the countryside and they would play their harps and tell stories. And uh, it's also called a lever harp because uh, you've got levers that change the pitch. And Dave will tell you about a really fun instrument he has. So the Irish drum is, uh, the per correct pronunciation is baron, where you roll the R and the H is silent. But you spell it nothing like so that, B-O-D-H-R-A-N. You wouldn't think that. The H bad. makes the D silent and you roll the R, baron. And these, like all frame drum instruments around the world of these, this nature, were used as agricultural instruments at one time. Is if you, if you harvested the fields and you'd get the wheat grain out on the floor of the threshing house, you would beat the, the grain with a flail. And then you would put what they call the rubble, which still contained the seed and, and the chaff, inside the drum. And the way you would separate the, the, the seed from the chaff was you would go out into the wind and you'd toss the rubble up into the air. The wind would blow away the chaff and the seeds would fall down into the drum, so thus separating the wheat from the chaff, as the saying goes. And uh, the Irish, like many cultures and all over the, all over the world uh, that have these kinds of frame drums, discovered they make great drums. And with their particular way of playing them, with this uh, beater here, it's called a tipper. And it's a very versatile drum. And oftentimes, it's been given attention so you can change the pitch. but. And, and some rim shuts. But also you can change the pitch. And you'll often see them in a Cayley band where they accompany a dance band Tell with them what a the Baron. Oh, a Cayley is, a, is an Irish house party. It's uh, much like a barn dance was here in America. Uh, you would have them in the kitchen or in the barn or wherever and uh, uh, people would uh, laugh, dance, sing, talk, tell jokes. Um, and various things. Uh, if you knew a poem, you would also do that during the Cayley. It's a celebration. The uh, Irish flute I, I'm playing, of course, is uh, 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 an invention that happened after the Renaissance. The, the cylindrical uh, Renaissance flutes with small holes were replaced by this uh, uh, instrument they call the Irish flute, but these were all through Europe, and by the Baroque period, they had a one, one key at the base here, so the one key flute, and, uh, uh, and they have a, a conical bore instead of a cylindrical bore, and when the new bomb system flute that you see in the modern orchestra came along, all the classical orchestras uh, would, and Baroque orchestras would go in there, and, uh, or classical orchestras would go in there and pawn their old wooden flutes and get the new metal uh, bohm system flute. Well, the Irish and all of the uh, traditional players around Europe got these out of the pawn shop, and this became the traditional flute. And they have a lovely, breathy sound with open holes. And the different size holes for these conical bores, this is what they call a Pratton design, named after Mr. Pratton. 
for a type of flute like that. And then, of course, the penny whistle. And these are seen all over the world, like drums. Penny whistles come in almost all, or occur in almost all agricultural cultures. And, uh, uh, and they have different tunings and different things. This is the Irish one. And of course, uh, originally they were made out of reeds and other things, uh, uh, but tin was, like we mentioned in the story, was something they did right away. They'd roll them out of tin and punch holes in them. So uh, have we got another question yet? Has, uh, we can think of one really quick. Oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah uh, oh, how much time? Oh, we did spend a, kind of a belated honeymoon touring Ireland, Ireland Scotland, uh, uh, Britain, Wales. Uh, I should let Carol Oh, I, I gave talk. him the signal that my <laughs> turn to talk. Um, so uh, we oh. went for 30 days. Yeah. How much time have we spent? Yeah. We, yeah. We, so we took a 30-day uh, trip through the British Isles. And we were in England, Scotland, Ireland. We spent a little more time in Wales, where Dave mentioned that we went to a, a language school for about a week there. And a big uh, aim of the tour was my Welsh heritage. I was able to go and see the farm that my great-great-grandmother, who was converted uh, to be a you know, Mormon pioneer, the farm that she left, we went and we found that and saw that. So we only got to spend like a few days in each of those countries. And I'm afraid we didn't get to go to the Isle of Man. I wish we had yeah. because it's not far from there. But we've done a lot of reading about it and we actually know people that have been from there and if you want to. Yeah, so the next in. question kind of dovetails with this. Does the Isle, does Isle of Man differ from Ireland? And yes, it does. When the, uh, when the Christian kind of... Uh, 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 movement happened, uh, and P St. Patrick came to Ireland. Many of the monks that, that studied in the monasteries and things uh, went out from Ireland and to convert uh, the you know Northern Europe from Christ to Christianity. And the Isle of Man was one of the first places that uh, uh, Coulomb Keeley went and some of the other uh, famous Irish saints that were the uh, disciples, you might say, of. Uh, of uh, St. Patrick, and uh, they differ from Ireland, and they speak Gaelic, but it's mixed with a Norse culture because the Vikings uh, made their, their raids from there, and they mixed with the people quite a bit, so the music and the language is very much a mixture of, of old Irish, Scottish, and Scandinavian, old Norse culture, and uh, a lot of their uh, other things uh, like the fairy world and the other world. So, what do you mean by the other world or the fairy the world? Is fairy a question. World. <laughs> so, the I, oh, tell them how fairies aren't oh, the little twins. They aren't the little uh, uh, flower fairies with little wings that they're hang around scarier. flowers. They're scarier. They're they they can do things to you. And at one time in the legends of Ireland, they were they could be huge, uh, very skilled and capable warriors with a lot of ability to, to forge but sometimes weapons. Sometimes they were little. You, they could be little, medium, But after big. Christianity happened, um, they diminished in size, and they inhabited the hills of Ireland in places. When they say the other world, uh, the, the Celts often believe that the other world or the fairy world coexists on top of our own. And, and it's kind of like a perception veil. Yes. And if you can perceive through that veil, you can see into the other world that is really all around you. Like the magic spectacles that could see that into could the see other world. It. And so, it, it, like I said, it, it exists, uh, co coincides with the, the mortal world. And uh, in, the, in Ireland, many of the uh, megalithic uh, burial mounds and things are believed to be fairy mounds. And that they come out from there and celebrate into the mortal world from time to time. How many instruments this, do, this do is we mine. play? <laughs> this, this is mine My. to answer because uh, I, I always say, do you want the uh, short answer or the long answer? The short answer is many. The long answer gets into a lot of things. But just, just to give you an idea, when I first met Dave like years ago at the, at the kind of uh, uh, Celtic dances I would go to, the other members of the band would take bets on how many he would bring that night. <laughs> and the bets were usually in the 12 to 15 number range for who would win. But our house is full of instruments. And uh, when, when our kind of 
oldest child moved out. His room got filled so full that we told him he can't come back. We have many, many, many. You can yeah. add kind of you in can. general. <laughs> what, and we not only <laughs> like this, we like old Utah you stuff. So there's banjos and mountain dulcimers. And if you, yeah, if you want to add lots of stuff. I told him, you can't move back in with me, boys. You're on your own because the, your rooms are full of instrument cases. So we, we collect... <laughs> uh, uh, probably way too many instruments, yeah. but we love So it. wind instruments from all over the world, uh, strings. Uh, my, my he made shakuhachi, the members, Japanese flutes. My band members used to call me strings for a long time. And then they started calling me more strings. More I strings, because, yeah. A, 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 a hammer dulcimer has tons of strings. We yeah. didn't bring it. So how common, oh, here's a good question. How common is belief in the fairy world nowadays? There still is some. If you go over there now, the older folks uh, and things, they have a respect for it. They may not entirely believe it. They are Christian. And like a lot of early Christian uh, beliefs, uh, there, there were many of the original folk beliefs that were incorporated into the new religion in the day. And uh, you would also have sometimes uh, a little shrine to the river god tucked over in a place by the church. Uh, but the, the main function was Christianity. Now, they believed in the fairy world and the, the gods that had a greater stature during that time as being the nature spirits or gods, a, a kind of pantheon. And uh, uh, you still see a respect for it nowadays, though the old people will say, well, that particular kind of thorn bush is sacred to the, the, the fairies. And so when the highway would go through this place and they would uh, want to bulldoze trees and other things that were sacred or, or uh, uh, fairy rings that were archaeological sites, uh, people in the area would stop them because they, in the tradition, they believed in this and they uh, had respect for it, even if their modern beliefs aren't such today. That's what I wanted to emphasize, is if you ask them, do you believe in the fairies, they'll probably say no. But if, uh, somebody, uh, if somebody wants to, like, build a road that went too close to the hill of Tara, they had mobs of people coming out They'd and show stopping up them from building that road. to stop they, them. They still respect and they might just say it's a superstition that I do, but it still shows up that way. But if you respect religions, uh, respecting that too is part of what you should do. So this, boy, these are some great questions. Is, is Welsh, the Welsh language different from Irish? It's and a how totally different related? language family, if you want to explain. Oh. It's, a very, it's a totally different language family than the Gaelic and Gallic. Yes. So the northern Gaelic, Gallic languages are Irish and Scottish Gallic. Irish Gaelic. Uh, you could also kind of originally include the Isle of Man, but here again, it's been modified by Norse, Old Norse. Um, and uh, in Wales, they speak the uh, uh, languages that are related to Wales. So it, Welsh, uh, Cornish, More the, and don't they call it Brythonic? More Brythonic Brit languages, Britain. the Brythonic Britain. branch of the Celtic family. Uh, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. And uh, does oh. Let's see. Oh, have you got Brittany? Boy, yes. this is great. Oh, uh, how many instruments? Oh, my favorite you? instrument. Oh, oh that's, Ooh, that's a tough one. Okay. So it, it, over 30 years, it's evolved. Uh, there for a while, I'd learn. Uh, I love the mountain dulcimer, the still opala. Plays it. And and we did a lot of fairs and things, and I still play it. And I must have learned 12 hours worth of music on it. Probably all from old time music. Kids say banjo. Yeah, uh, probably for old time. I love the claw hammer banjo, and of course. If I had to pack light, the flute has been my favorite from time to time, and they, they change a little bit. But I started out as a guitar player, so I just started that way, but I branched out. And you might be able to guess that the harp is my favorite, and I didn't play it until that wedding present Dave gave me. I've played hammer dulcimer, I've played piano. I like the whistles because you can carry them around. <clears throat> But Dave gave me that harp, and he said, now you don't have to play this, but I sure hope you'll <laughs> want to, and it's now my favorite. So, so we like instrument pairs, you know. Like, like we know a lot of couples where the fiddle player marries a guitar player, and that's what we... You know that Celtic. Way. Oh, there's a Celtic handout. <laughs> Dave does. That He's we, looked at it. We wrote uh, uh, probably about half of the Celtic handout that's on the website. There's a, some great resources. There's some books I just love that... Uh, and, and I couldn't help myself, I, you know, I tend to branch out, uh, uh, but there's a great book on Irish culture and, and uh, heroic and mythological tales. The Irish believe them to be part of history as it came to recorded history. They believe this mythology to be 
and in a way historical. They have a reverence for it. Uh, there are also some other books there. Uh, there's a one about classical mythology and, and uh, Norse uh, uh, beliefs and that sort of thing, but just a number of things. Beowulf is on, on this site, and uh, if you're going to immerse yourself in ancient cultures uh, uh, from Europe, northern Europe, this is a great start. Oh. We're looking at our sign here. Oh, 11 a.m. Uh, 11 a.m. 11 a.m., uh, YouTube only, MDT, which is Mountain Daylight Time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, young, young adults, uh, 17. Okay. 17 and up, that is? So uh, we'd like to think. No, 17. We'd down. like to thank <laughs> Rachel. Okay. And uh, uh, for, for organizing this festival, we're so honored to be part of it. We're Dave and Carol Sharp, and uh, uh, we, we call ourselves Idlewild. Uh, I'm idle, and she's wild.